feel right. It doesn't? No, the landscape doesn't feel right. Let's go back and read the directions. Today, were you going to ask me to uh, speak about how the job started and all that? Yeah, I think it might be just a you know just be real sure. kind of practical about it. And you'd already worked with Saarinen at that. Point, oh yes, and yes. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, Errol, uh, I first met Errol, you know, through Lucan. Lucan introduced me to Errol. We had a, I was working on a project out in uh, Detroit with Lou Kahn. It was a Balmer plant housing project in, outside of Detroit. And uh, one night we had a big party, and all these proper gentlemen from Philadelphia were up, and, and we had, I remember it was at the Russian Bear restaurant. And we played this game, drink you under the table like the Russians, you know, and you stand up and you all stand up and click your heels and drink, and then you crawl under the table. I was the last one to crawl under. <laughs> Everybody was up. <laughs> and finally, this proper gentleman got uh, creeping around the room under ladies' legs and so forth and other chairs. And it was fantastic. You know, before they were got drunk, right? they, they were very proper, and, uh, but then they get, get loosened up. Anyway, Eric kept asking, every job he got, he asked me if I, if I was available, and so then he mentioned the Miller house, and he asked me if I'd go out with him. I, I, I was sort of scared of flying, and I take the train most of the time, and uh, so we flew. I flew with Eric. It was one of those uh, planes that had a supercharger, and it kind of pauses in the air for a minute until it changes or something. And when it did that, Arrow said, what's that? I said, Arrow, I thought you didn't mind flying. <laughs> it didn't bother me. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we met. Hit, hit, the first meeting with Erwin Miller was in Columbus, Indiana. And it was at the Palm Restaurant. It was the only restaurant there. And there were about 12 people at Arrow and, and uh, his one of his people and me and some others. And Irwin is sort of a sober type, you know, he's uh, was deep in the study of Bach Samada and that sort of thing. Um, and so he, he started out by saying, I don't drink, but if everyone, anyone wants to have a drink, you know, I like that thing, you know, it's, it's, it's very nice, but maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> and so I volunteered, I said, I'll have a double scotch. <laughs> and so everybody broke down and started all the drinks after that. So that's how we met, first met. I had pretty much a free hand to work on the Miller House. I mean, they had, had the concept of the house all worked out. He and Kevin Roach. Kevin was very important in the design of that. And uh, so I, I really designed the thing out of touch with Arrow and Kevin. I mean, my design was, took off from the house plan, which is a loose arrangement of blocks with free space, and developed it outly as a series of, of rooms, in effect, you know. It's, just, uh, it's kind of a pavilion-type house, and you can't connect uh, in a linear way from it. You have to connect in, in the round, you might say, like it's Villa Rotunda. You know, how do you connect? What do you do there? So you do spatial units. It's, it has a centrifugal aspect to it. Well, this is a very geometric layout, although in space it doesn't feel geometric. It feels only, you see it in plan. People don't understand that, that many times a plan layout may look very formal or geometric, but in spatial reality, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, constrain you at all. It's just the opposite. It releases you if, if it's done in a certain way. So anyway, I remember Arrow saying to Kevin, well, we should let Dan go more, you know, in other words, to get into the design aspect from the beginning more. And I always remember that comment. The Millers were very, very good. If they, everyone wanted to understand what was happening. Once he understood and approved, there was no problem. And they kept it up meticulously over those years, which is quite rare. 
Yeah. He gets some of it done with that wonderfully. Yeah. If they were both enthusiastic about my getting the kind of plants I wanted, and we had a lot of luck, you know, we had two magnolias uh, here, here, and here. And uh, there was an estate in Rye, New York, where a road was going through. And I don't know how we found out about it, but beautiful shaped magnolias, you know, big. And we moved them from Rye, New York, out to Columbus. Uh, and they grew beautifully, excepting one died at the entrance, and, uh, and it seems strange why it should die. And, uh, you know, when something dies, everybody wants to blame you or everybody. And so we had this, I thought I'd better get the soil analyzed. I got it analyzed, and they find there was oil in the soil. Oh, you know what, and what, then they, they discovered that this painter used to take his paint thing and drop the, the, the residue from his paint pail into the soil. That's what killed it. So that's why we put the big weeping beach, and we have only one magnolia. There used to be two magnolias. See, I wanted two, two, two. And then once I did the big beach there, I said maybe we should do the two beach on the west side rather than the magnolia. So things happen during the process. That I think some of the most exciting things one does in the best design is when you are working with a client and you're open to receive even a requirement that destroys your cute little scene, you know. You get all in love, how students get in love with the little design, they don't want to, they want to break down. And I've, my best work has come where we've had to change, you know. I like what, uh, I can't quote it, but what Ralph Waldo Emerson says about beauty, he, he, he does it in very eloquent terms. He says, if you seek beauty, all you get is a weak, sickly, effeminate, uh, and something else. Okay? He says, if you seek truth, you might get beauty. <laughs> One of the many things I admire about what you do as a landscape architect is the, your um, connections to vegetation. You know, you always, oh. you don't talk about alleys, you talk about an alley of lindens. And, of course. And you, and you know that the feeling of light under a linden is different from the white under exactly. a horse chestnut. Yeah. And, I mean... I'm also the texture, the scale, the leaf, but everything about it. The whole experience you know. yeah. is a different yeah. thing. How did you... I mean, for me, I kind of feel like plants were in the uh, gene mix. Um, no, no, I got it. But, but, but you learned a lot from Warren Manning. I was right? lucky, yeah, because... I, Manning was the greatest plant expert in the country, according to Liberty Hyde Bailey, uh, the Bailey Encyclopedia. And uh, I traveled all around with him as a kid, you know, I was, I was 19, and drove him around in my Ford convertible Model A. And uh, I worked in the nursery, too, for a couple of summers. And um, I, I think that's important that you get, if you're a landscape architect, you should at least know plants very, very well. Uh, all, not how to identify them so much as how to use them. And, and being, uh, being able to identify them and then seeing what's appropriate for, for that kind of a place or this kind of a place. You know, an alley of London plane trees is beautiful and does one thing. Uh, but in another case, it might not be the best choice. Ginkgos might be, especially if it's in the city.